We have three fantastic panelists with us uh, today. We have uh, Jez Humble, who uh, used to uh, be, I think, the co-founder or the CTO of uh, Chef, wrote a few books, and uh, he lives out in Oakland with his partner and two fantastic kids. Um, and um, then we have Jeff Lembeck, who is an engineering manager at Ease. And he is out in the middle of nowhere with his parents, his partner, and his uh, child or their child um, all living together at their parents' house because they got stuck in the middle of a trip to visit their parents. So they even he even has his siblings there. And then we have uh, Lori Voss, who was co-founder of uh, uh, Amazing, uh, which was a, kind of like what Bitly uh, is. And then he was COO of, um, of uh, NPM, uh, but mostly he uh, is uh, newly engaged. And I believe he got engaged to his partner because he's in love with the dog. Um, so, uh, and uh, Jez knows all too well that when I meet people, I make fun of them. Um, so I'm glad he's covering his face and he's afraid of what I'm gonna say about him. But mostly uh, we have uh, the three of you. So why don't you go ahead and, and do a little bit more introduction of yourselves and then I'll start with some questions. You want to nominate us? Who should go first? Jez, go first, please. Okay, yeah, so just to clarify, I did not co-found Chef. I did co-found a company called DevOps Research and Assessment LLC, which was acquired by Google last year. Uh, my co-founder, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, um, was CEO, uh, written a few books on technology, and uh, I also am a lecturer at AUC Berkeley, that's me. And his last name is Humble, but don't let that fool you. Yeah, my wife says humble by name, insufferable by nature. <laughs> Jeff, do you, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, I'm Jeff Lembeck. I am normally residing in Seattle. I had engineering manager for ease uh fun fact Lori and i worked together at our last job uh so we, we have experience being on one of these screens um, but yeah uh, I, I am i am stuck in eastern washington for the time being a lot of my daughter helped me decorate with these balloons we couldn't blow up the long ones <laughs> we tried really hard I'll show you a trick to do it later. And uh, Lori, would you like to go next? Uh, yeah, one second. So this is the dog. <laughs> uh, his name is Guff. It's supposed to be a secret. That that's why my marriage is happening. But OK, cat's out of the bag, I suppose. Uh, I am um, primarily a web developer. Uh, that's what I think of myself as. Um, but for the last 10 years, I founded a couple of companies. One was called Awesome, not amazing, but I could see how you got there. Um, and uh, the other one is NPM. Um, and now I'm at Netlify, um, which is a very fun place to work if uh, you're building websites. Um, so uh, that's me. Okay, so um, we, here we have a, um, a a panel with three very accomplished uh, cis white men. So I assume that the topic is going to be men in tech. <laughs> so, uh, let me ask you a few questions about being a man um, in this field. Um, so let me start off with like, how do you balance your, your personal life with your work life? Who goes first? <laughs> I think you just volunteered yourself, Laurie. Don't. Um, how do I balance my life, my, my personal life and my work life? Well, at the moment, it's extremely easy because I'm trapped in my apartment and they're the same thing. Um, uh, in general, though, I, I think I find it, I have it easier um, than even most white men, um, since as a gay man, uh, I just have, you know, the needs of my partner to occasionally consider, plus the needs of the dog um, and no uh, dependent, no other dependent mammals um, to take care of. So uh, I'm not usually required to do anything past that. So, you know, easy mode has an even easier setting for me, I think. Jeffrey, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, I 
uh, prior to the um, gigantic apocalyptic settings that are going on outside, uh, I wake up when my and and take my daughter to school in the morning. Uh, my wife and I work a separate. Uh, she works a little earlier, and I take care of the mornings and take care of my daughter or take my daughter to school, and then she can pick her up from school in the afternoons. Uh, but since I've worked remotely for the past eight years from my office in my house, I then just walk downstairs uh, afterward and get on at 9.30 and then get off at 5.30 and leave my computer in there. Um, I have uh, uh, that, that is the, the ticket to my sanity. Um, so the artwork that was made for you today? Oh, yes. Uh, I have some, I have some Play-Doh in my house. And so my daughter made this little girl for me uh, for art class today. So that was done with the, uh, the kit. I see you've done a great job decorating your office. She, she is, uh, she is quite the artist. Um, but yes, takes up every waking hour that is not work. And Jez, how do you, how do you manage your work-life balance? Uh, thanks for asking. And, you know, just because I know that um, uh, sarcasm doesn't always work uh, cross-culturally, I just want to clarify, obviously, this is a satirical question because men never got asked how they balance their work and life because the assumption is that they have a partner who will, who will handle all that kind of uh, uh, externality, basically. Um, uh, but I think the thing is, like, as men, we should think about that a lot more. And I actually especially coming from Europe where there is a concept of work-life balance that is supposed to be real. Uh, and we do actually in general take our holidays. I think it's really important for, for men to do that. So I am pretty good about, you know, stopping work at five and coming home and then doing my best to transition to like actually be present um, with about a success rate of 50% probably. Um, and uh, Behind me, you can see the desk that my daughter is using when she's uh, homeschooling because we're not allowed out because of the virus. Um, so I am actually in charge of homeschooling my daughter and my wife is homeschooling our, our youngest daughter um, because, um, you know, certain dynamics involving teaching particular subjects. I, I've got my eldest daughter. Um, but, I, you know, my main wish is like, men should take paternity leave and they should take it for as long as they possibly can so that that's normalized and men should go home and turn off their phones and not answer their emails when they go home and not normalize the fact that you're supposed to work crazy hours uh, and let's as men model the things that uh, we want to be the case for everyone so that that's normalized and I try and do that just selfishly because you know uh, you know, I love working all hours that God sends, and I would much rather be working 24 hours than doing anything else. That was sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fundamentally lazy. Uh, so, uh, so you've reached to where you are today. So I want to know, how can we get boys more interested in improving their communication skills um, and the other soft skills that make uh, people really successful in the workplace? That's an amazing question and so important. And I think this, this just goes to the heart of, of everything about computers that, um, you know, there was, there's, there's some great books, which I should have had with me because this is the time when we need them, um, which talk about how in the early days of computers, it was women who were doing the computer programming in the days of mainframes. And then basically when uh, men realized that this was the kind of thing that they could uh, dominate and, uh, and get paid a lot of money for, they booted all the women out. Um, and they designed these tests to try and assess if people should uh, were suitable for a career in computing, which basically tested for uh, being very socially awkward and being able to just sit down and sit around the computers and, and not talk to people. Um, and which is why when you Google hacker on Google, there's a picture of someone with a hoodie sitting at a computer in a darkened room because, you know, that's. So we want to we want to get rid of that. I think you know so, someone on Twitter who I wish I remember the name of notably said that extreme programming is basically like a program to compensate for the lack of social skills um, of, of of dudes in programming, which I which I thought was pretty spot on. And I think you know the answer to this is, you know, that individual performance isn't a thing. 
what's the thing is teams performing. And in order to do that, we have to help people work effectively on teams. And I think this should be part of basic developer education. Certainly, anytime you onboard someone, part of the training should be how to work effectively in a team. When you do performance, uh, as we do at Google and other companies, how you work on a team should be explicitly considered for performance. When we're giving rubrics for promotion, um, how you perform on a team and, and your ability to do that should be part of the rubric for promotion. This stuff should be everywhere. It should be part of our education. It should be part of how we hire people explicitly. It should be explicitly part of how we promote people. And we should make sure that we reward people who are good at that and, and help people who are not good at that. Um, it sounds like, Jeff, you also have a daughter and no sons. So we don't have any sons here. But how do you think in general we could get uh, boys in, uh, interested? I, think, I mean, I think that was a, a great general answer. But how um, also specifically can we get boys interested in improving their soft skills? How can we convince them that it's, that it's important um, before they get to Google and don't get a promotion or actually would be any other company and not get a promotion? Because... Um, they're, you know, they're not inclusive and not helping uh, people grow because they're focused on themselves or, or, or they're hacking and not realizing uh, that you have to bring people up with them, with you. Yeah. So uh, th this may be at the, at the seeing this through a lens of having a five-year-old, but I feel like a conversation that happens a lot and that doesn't, I, I, I don't, hear it as much. I don't hear it becoming a regular thing as much with little boys, but it happens a lot with my daughter is when is making sure that when she is feeling a feeling very heavily to try and see if she could name it. Um, because the concept of being able to address and name the feeling that you're feeling makes it so your norm your automatic response is not necessarily what automatic response for well i mean was on the playground when i was a kid hit um we have largely uh from my you know from my point of view largely promoted the idea that um young boys and young men are supposed to stoically go through things by themselves um burst out in violence or in uh, when something is not going their way uh, and you know handle things alone without stating what it is that they're actually feeling or addressing it at any point and I think that starting there uh, is a is a really good way to get people to um, to get boys uh, to the point where they can speak on these things uh, and then I also think that we should absolutely drill home writing. Um, writing cultures tend to, uh, the, the best software developers I've ever met are all phenom phenomenal writers. Uh, and I think that that uh, hitting them earlier with creative and conceptual writing and making sure that they have to like things aren't tested just in isolation but presentations and writing assignments etc will help with those so-called uh, soft skills um, because that's really where they all are is in how you communicate okay so Lori, i mean uh, building off of what jeffrey said you've hired um a lot of people um, and you built a really excellent team at npm how were you able to interview and filter to make sure that the team that you were hiring was made up of good writers who knew how to label their feelings? Huh. Um, or, or were you successful at that? I'm not sure. I mean, it sounds like you were. But. It's, it's an excellent question. Um, uh, both Isaac and I um, are very, we care a lot about writing. Um, and that was something we noticed very early on about ourselves that was very um, unusual is that we were like the quality of the writing of, of our coworkers was something that we appreciated and noticed. Um, so we explicitly made it 
um, a, a hiring criterion. We were like, you know, communication skills means that you have to be very comfortable with writing because the um, the work pattern, especially with a company that had a lot of remote people, meant that you had to do a lot of writing. Right? You couldn't, you know, you couldn't sort of bumble your way through a meeting and get past it. Um, because a lot of people would be, you know, in different time zones or reading it, you know, a day later. And if your if your writing wasn't clear, it didn't work. So um, we definitely started looking for that kind of stuff in the writing. Um, fortunately, resumes are kind of like they're not actually a very good test or or a demonstrator of very many things, but they are quite a good demonstrator of how good you are at writing, um, because they are an, they're an exercise in. Uh, summarization and, pre and presenting information in a written way, right? Like that's the challenge of a resume is making something that, you know, is condensing your whole life into a couple of pages. Um, so it's one of the few things you can tell from a resume is whether or not this person is, is going to be any good at writing. Um, but um, to uh, go back to the earlier question, I think the, um, which is sort of related to this is like the way that you get those, you get, um, men and boys to focus on those skills um, is just by demanding it, right? Like there's, um, I can't tell you how many times in previous jobs, uh, you know, there's been a coworker where people have gone like, well, you know, he's really bad at, you know, he's really bad at giving presentations, but uh, you know, you can tell he knows his shit. Um, and I never heard anybody say that about a lady. I never heard anybody say that, oh, she, you know, she's really bad at presenting, but I'm sure she knows what she's talking about. If she wasn't good at presenting, the assumption was she doesn't know what she's talking about. In fact, even when she was good at presenting, the assumption would be she doesn't know what she's talking about. Um, so as is going to be, answered, be the answer to many of these questions, the answer is like, there's an unconscious bias there and you just have to be aware of it. Like you cannot give men a pass. If, you, if men are repeatedly told, well, you know, that was a good idea, but you didn't talk about it properly, then men will get the idea that talking about it properly is part of the job. Um, that's a, a thing um, when I was hiring that it was a big, um, it was a big challenge early on to sort of instill into our hiring and recruitment process that like only, you know, at most 50% of your job as an engineer is the engineering and 50% of your job as an engineer is talking about what it is that you're doing and communicating what it is that you're doing. Because if you do really good code and nobody knows what it's for or why you wrote it, then it's as if you didn't write the code. The communication is just as important. So uh, thank you for that. And so just to follow up um, and can be answered by you by anyone, but like how do you filter through all those applications when um, you have a bunch of uh, people who are completely overestimating their skill set on that resume? <laughs> that was a huge problem. In fact, I got into, I, I remember very clearly getting into trouble in like, I think it was like month three or four of, um, of NPM because I was filtering through hundreds of resumes. Um, and I actually tweeted, I was like, I was like, dear women, if you have got more than a year of experience at something, it is fine to call yourself an expert at this thing. And people immediately started shouting at me like, you are demanding that women change their behavior to match men and that's sexist. And that was true. That's exactly what I was doing. I was like, I was like implicitly I saying- Experts. Sorry? I said men should not label themselves as experts. If it's only... true. Why does a man who has a year of experience in anything immediately label himself as experts? But you know, I have read thousands of resumes and that is the bar as far as men are concerned. If you have been doing something for a year, you label yourself as expert at that thing. Um, you know, some people are doing it for six months are like expert level at this thing. And I'm like, you don't even know what that is yet. You've not even tried it. Um, so again, it's like I said, the answer to this question is going to be the answer to a lot of these questions. It's an unconscious bias. You have to know that when a man is writing the resume, they are going to be overestimating their skills and you have to grade everything down. And you have to know that when women are writing their resumes, they will be saying, oh, I only know this a little bit when actually they've been doing it for five years. So maybe for someone else to either answer that question, do you want to follow up, or should I um, have my follow up question? I mean, I, I do have a I do have a quick follow up on this. I mean, well, one of the things that a lot of places try and do is anonymize um, resumes, uh, strip out the, any gender specific terminology or race specific stuff as well, because you know we talk but, about gender. But if, but if someone's saying they have their expert <sighs> versus someone saying they're novice, that defeats right. Them. So this is the problem, right? It, it, that that then removes the piece of information that allows you to correct for the fact that men, um, and there's been studies done on this, that men 
uh, willing to call themselves experts and kind of self-aggrandize in the way that in general women are. So that's a problem, right? So I think one of the things that um, can be done is let's talk about objective facts and, and strip everything out that is subjective. And there's only so far you can go with that, but instead of asking, you know, how do you assess your performance in this thing? Talk about you know, how many years have you been doing it? Um, what, what actual experiences have you had and, and stuff like that? Um, I'd be really interested to hear if anyone has actually done that. We were anonymizing for a while um, uh, until it, it, it became very, very expensive to anonymize basically because it's very, you, you know, any kind of machine generated, we are going to anonymize this thing is fucking impossible. That never works. So we had to have an actual human whose job it was to anonymize things. Um, and, uh, you know, when we got 3000 candidates for one job, we were like, we can't do that right now. Um, but, uh, Jez, as you mentioned, like the, you know, even just asking how long somebody has been doing something like a man who had, you know, 5% of their job being doing this thing for a year will say, oh, I have a year's worth of experience for that. Mm -hmm. And it was often my experience that women who were like, oh, well, it was only half of my job. So I didn't count it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh no. Um, it's just a minefield uh, because it's very hard to um, it's very hard to read something out of out of somebody that they haven't put in there, especially when you have something as low signal as a resume to work on. So engineering requires a lot of multitasking. So what I'm wondering is why do you think men keep getting hired when we basically know that women are more experienced at multitasking? Yes, but we, we correct for that by making them <coughs> sit in a darkened room with headphones on and uh, posting blog posts about how meetings are evil. So that, that's, that's how we correct for that, by uh, creating a work environment that strongly favors the inability to uh, multitask. I never thought of it before, but that's exactly what we're doing, isn't it? Brilliant. I mean, <laughs> she can really improve on that. You're basically we call it... That's we so call good. our inability to multitask flow. Flow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm worrying so much. Uh, I the the amount of systems that we have created to make it so uh, developers can stay on task is amazing. Um, the the like. Here's a Kanban board, which by the way, I love because I have to have a list that is in very specific order to make sure that I follow the thing that is prioritized because I, man, am not necessarily good at this. Uh, and there's whole systems around building these things to make it so people stay on task. And God knows every, God knows it's really, really difficult and requires like consistent pushing to make it so the average man who's reported to me historically actually like keeps track on that board, um, but they probably need it more uh, than the women who always just fill it out. And I always know exactly what they're doing all of the time because they are like, oh yeah, I finished this thing and then this thing, and then we've got these priorities shipped and here's this. Uh, you're going back to communication is what you're saying. It, this is like the the concepts we like we just create communication tools um, over and over and over again to try to fill in this hole of where people don't necessarily go to. And I think you know the reason one of the reasons I think women feel the need to communicate more is so that people will know that they're actually doing what they're supposed to do. Maybe because we assume that men are you know men haven't told you anything for a couple of days it's because they're terribly hard at work. Um, so we kind of have this, this assumption maybe as well. And going back to my theme of uh, uh, XP being uh, compensation for, uh, <clears throat> for like men's inability to, to do certain things like multitasking. I, had a, I used to work with this guy who um, took a lot of drugs and did a lot of partying when he was young. And he used to say how much he loves doing test-driven development because when you're doing TDD, you only have to remember was I writing a test or was I writing the code that made the test pass? Um, so it's basically, again, a crutch for those of us who are not great at multitasking um, to, to be able to like stay on track and, and achieve flow. Never, it's never occurred to me how much of the stuff that we've, how many of the systems we've built are just like 
mental crutches for men's inability to multitask. Now I'm going to see it everywhere. Continuous integration. Continuous integration forces you to integrate your code into trunk. Version control is a communication tool, primarily. Continuous integration is basically saying, don't go off on your own for three days in a darkened room and write loads of code. Stop every hour and check it into trunk. And developers hate that because it means they have to talk to other people. Also, uh, close to my heart, um, uh, modularity. One of the one of the uh, sort of founding principles of NPM is that like the more modules you have, the better. Um, and one of the things about of, about modularity is that the average size of a module is about the size that one person can work on by themselves pretty effectively. Like there are some that are violations of that rule, um, but the reason there are many, many, many small modules is because men find it easier to work on one module at a time. And then you only need to know about the interactions between the modules and not how the modules work together. Um, and it's only just occurred to me that that is also gendered. Yeah, so, so, mu so much of everything, all like good practice around how we work, how we architect, all this stuff is built around stereotypes that we've created as a culture. Which is gendered. Um, and and right, let's not forget about race as well, because you know, so let's talk about race a little bit. Um, I'm not the right person to talk about it, but basically, uh, you, you know, we've we 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 have all had to we should have all had to address it, and yet some of us have only, only if some people have addressed it. So what I'd like to know is how you can use your privilege to spread that easy setting. Who wants to go first on this one? Well, I've got some. I, I, I was somewhat prepared for a question like this. I think, you know, one of the things that it's super important to do as a, as a dude is, you know, and I, there's like the, the micro stuff, like, you know, if someone is getting talked over in a meeting, making sure you're like, hey, can we listen to what X said? Or if someone says something and then someone else claims it as their idea without crediting someone, we're like, oh yeah, that was a great idea of X. So there's like all these micro things that we can do, like saying, so uh, X, I know you've got an opinion on this um, that I was really interested in. Can you talk about that? Um, like when, uh, you know, and I teach, I'm a lecturer at UC Berkeley, and this is something we have to be aware of when we're calling on people in class. Some people don't want to speak up. Some people are introverted. Um, you know, again, white dudes tend to feel very comfortable speaking up in a way that non-white dudes might not. So we have to find ways to compensate that. And, and that's true in our work culture as well. You'll find some people are very good at like loudly expressing their opinions. And then there's some people who don't. So design thinking is really good for this, for example, which is anytime you're going to discuss something, make people first write down their thoughts on sticky notes and then stick them on the board and then discuss them as a group. That's one way to make sure that everyone's opinion gets shared on the, on the team, not just the opinion of the person who shouts out. So using like design thinking techniques can help with this as well. So there's lots of these like little micro things that you can do. Uh, you know, obviously when someone's being a dick, find a way to say, maybe don't do that. Um, and then there's also macro things as well. Um, things like uh, making sure when there's an internal leadership position posted that we actually post it and actually assess candidates and make sure that those candidates are representative of, of the wider population, that we don't just say, oh, well, there's this, we really need a, someone to lead this. Uh, I know Dave would be really good at it. So let's just have Dave do it. No, you know, let's treat this the same as any job opening. Let's make sure we're looking at these metrics like um, retention. How long are people staying before they leave? Is that gendered? Is that, does that differ based on race? How long does it take before people get promoted? Does that differ on race? Does that differ on gender or other protected characteristics? So there's these macro things that we have to be doing as well. My, um, this question to me is mostly about inclusion, I feel. Um, and um, my experience of, of inclusion is mostly at uh, much smaller companies, I think, um, than you've worked at, Jez. Uh, and um, the single most effective thing that we did to increase inclusion, at least at the hiring stage, um, was simply leaving um, job postings open for longer. Um, because uh, hiring has strong network effects. People hear about jobs from people who already work there or people who you know, already follow that company. Um, so people who are similar to you are generally speaking closer to you in your network, right? Your network is full of people who are like you. So if you are looking for people who are more unlike you, you have to give them more time to get the news, right? Um, so 
I, n- I never did uh, stats on it, unfortunately, when I had when I had the stats available. But I, anecdotally, um, I definitely noticed that you know the first wave of job applications for when we open a new position, like first three days, like it's all, you know, dudes and usually dudes I knew. Um, and then like two or three weeks later was when people who I didn't know about and had never heard of before started showing up who were just as good, but it had taken them three weeks to hear about the opportunity because they were just that much further away in the network. Um, and so we began to have like, it, it cost us a lot because, um, you know, sometimes a really good candidate will walk in the door on day one and, you know, we're like, well, we hold this job position open for three weeks. And by three weeks later, they'd already got a job. Um, so, you know, we lost candidates that way, but I was like, the, this is what increases the diversity of our pool. Therefore we must keep job positions open for three weeks. And the thing is the person who could get a job like that is someone who's networked anywhere and can work anywhere because they, they, um, they already are on the easy setting. I mean, it's amazing how many people were laid off last week and already have a job this week. Uh, so uh, we just have a couple minutes left. So I did have three more questions, but instead of asking my questions, um, why don't I just ask um, if there's anything that you really wanted to, to share um, or sum up? I just want to give a shout out to a couple of some books. Um, this is Nathan Ensmerger's The Computer Boys Takeover which is about some of the things that we were talking about, about the history. Uh, this is uh, Ma Hick's book, Programmed Inequality, uh, which is about how Britain discarded women technologists and lost its edge in computing. And I don't have it to hand, but also Frida Kapoor Klein's Giving Notice, why the best and brightest are leaving the workplace and how you can help them stay, I, I found interesting. Um. Somebody in the in the chat asked uh, to ensure more inclusive hiring. Should the hiring team uh, be composed of a more diverse makeup? Um, uh, and the answer is definitely yes. There, um, one of the uh, one of the things that I noticed about NPM in particular was that, um, to an absurd degree, the diversity of the team that started the company was the same exactly the same level of diversity it became as it grew. So when we started the company, there were two queer people, there were two women. Um, there was one person who um, identified as Latino. Uh, so, you know, two queer people is 40%, two women is 40%, and uh, a single Latino out of five people is 20%. And that shouldn't work like that. But when we were 100 people, well, not when we were 100 people, when we were 50 people, that's almost exactly the levels we were at still. We were 20% Latino, we were 40% queer, which is ridiculous. Uh, and we were 40% women. And it was, it was, it was just the, the company you are at the very beginning is the company that you stay forever. Um, so it's uh, whenever I'm on a panel that is asking, that is talking about diversity and inclusion, I'm always like, I don't know how to fix it once the company already exists. I only know how to fix it right at the very beginning. And even then, I don't know how to fix it if you don't start with 10 people. <laughs> um, uh, I think I think um, one of the companies that I most admire for the sheer amount of effort and money that they poured into um, being diverse and inclusive right from the very get-go uh, was Slack. Um, it's been pointed out by a couple of people that Slack was an unusual IPO and it created a number of black millionaires. Um, and there aren't a lot of IPOs with a, of, of, of which that is true. Um, and it was not an accident. It was because from the very beginning, I was hearing about what they were doing and they were pouring money into DNI efforts and, and uh, hiring, uh, hiring diversely in particular. And they put out a great product. I mean, that helps. <laughs> no, I mean, no, but the thing is, I think it was because they had a diverse team that they put out a great product, not the other oh, way. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if we didn't have teams and organizations and companies filled with white dudes, maybe there'd be less. Uh, startups that are focused on doing laundry and, and getting food and, and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> oh, just just spitballing here. Nail on the head right there. Uh, I like to add on there that um, it, speaking from a management position, uh, the hiring and making sure that you like in your to attempt to break the mold that the company has already set is 
is an incredible amount of effort. Um, the amount of time that people put into hiring right now as management, which I I know because I've seen several times over, they will not know a thing about the candidate until they are five minutes before speaking. The amount of outreach that one must do in order to try to buck these trends, to make it so people feel safe applying at a place where a team is 10 people and all of them are white and two of them are women. Um, if, you know, in some cases that that's better stats than others. Uh, the to make somebody feel safe to join that is is a task that you need to understand as part of the job and that it will absolutely make you lose sleep at night. And that is the job that you have taken on. And, and I think also it's just so easy to spend all that time on that and then have an executive suite full of white dudes who all look the same and behave the same. and and just don't emphasize it. And then you may as well not have bothered with any of that stuff. And, and that, that's, I've seen that many times. Well, I want to thank you all for, um, for being on this panel. Um, and I also want to reach out to the attendees and say, I hope that you picked something up and that it's, um, it's not enough to, to just be like, yay, I agree with everything, but it, you, I hope that you try to be an ally. And an ally is not someone that says, yay, I agree with everything. It's someone who actually doesn't say anything about, yay, what I'm doing, but actually does it. So I encourage you all to, um, when you see something at work, put your, you know, walk the walk. We don't need to hear people talk the talk as much as we need people to walk the walk. So when you hear someone being um, spoken over at work who has a good idea, be that ally. Don't tweet about being that ally. Don't post pictures of yourself donating stuff. Just donate stuff. Donate your time. Donate your energy. Um, so thank you very much.